I uh, hope you all are doing well. We've got a really exciting announcement here today about, well, you probably figured it out, about rural infrastructure, which builds off a lot of the support that we've provided, uh, certainly since I've been governor. Joining us here today is your FDOT Secretary, Jared Perdue. Uh, we also have uh, Director Shane Morgan from Columbia County. Uh, and then Levy County Chair, Desiree Mills. And we're also pleased to be joined by several officials from Columbia, Levy, Madison, and Suwannee County. So I want to thank all of you for coming and thank for, thank for, for what you're doing uh, to make Florida continue to be great. As, as many of you know, Florida has uh, grown significantly um, in recent years. Uh, really, I mean, we've grown for, for many decades in, on and off, but certainly in the last four or five years, uh, we've had a lot of migration into the state. Not because I'm asking, mind you. Uh, I'm fine. We've got great people. I mean, we don't necessarily need, but the reality is, is people have viewed Florida as a place where they could have a high quality of life. And so we've seen people move from the West Coast, the Northeast, the Midwest, you name it, uh, to Florida uh, for a variety of different reasons, uh, some to escape the COVID regimes in those states a couple years ago, some because of education, some because of law and order, just some because they like the sunshine, right? So there's a whole bunch of reasons why. And, and consequently, our economy uh, has outperformed the nation as a whole. If you look back uh, over the last 45 months, Florida's unemployment rate has been lower than the national average. And right mm -hmm. now, our unemployment rate is a full percentage point lower than the na nation as a whole. Uh, since 2019, when I became governor, we have led the nation in new business formations. A total of 3.1 million businesses, almost all small businesses, formed, and 370,000 just this year. We're also number one for business relocations, uh, companies moving from states like New York, California, Illinois. It used to be that governors would travel the country, meet with businesses, and really put on a hard sales pitch about why you should move uh, to the state. Uh, my first year as governor, we did a little bit about, about that, but then as we got into COVID and beyond, uh, what ended up happening was like these companies would just call us and they'd say, hey, we're coming. We want to let you know. We want to thank you for what you're doing, all these things. And so uh, not surprising that we're number one for business relocation. Uh, since I took office in 2019, uh, the nation as a whole's economy has grown, gross domestic product, by uh, a little more than 11%. Florida, over that same period of time, has grown 22%, our economy. Uh, and so that's, that's basically double the growth of the nation as a whole. Uh, and not surprisingly, as a result, U.S. News and World Report, uh, or excuse me, CNBC has ranked um, us number one for economy two years in a row. And I guess actually U.S. News may have done that too uh, recently. So our GDP, uh, I think... It, People have different estimates, but between like the if, if our Florida was a separate country, our economy would rank between 13th and 16th in the world if we were a separate country, uh, and so that is um, in the top 10% uh, of nations uh, what would be, and there's a lot of other things that, that that we're doing that I think is is really really good. One of the things is managing our fiscal situation well. You know we've done more for investing in education than any time in Florida history. We've raised teacher salaries every year for the last four years. We have universal school choice. Uh, we have more per pupil going to schools than we've done, ever had in Florida history. Uh, we've also done more for infrastructure and transportation. Our budget for FDOT is the highest in Florida history. We've also done things like I'll mention in a, m a minute, moving Florida forward, where we did a big influx of cash to be able to accelerate a lot of these projects that are really, really needed because the state's growing. We've done more for environmental stewardship, restoring everything from the Florida Everglades to our springs to our beaches and had historic, historic investments. And yet, while we're doing all those really big things, this year's budget, we're actually spending less than we did last year overall. We're actually cutting taxes by a billion and a half dollars, and we've accelerated the repayment of the state's outstanding debt. So if you look from the history of Florida in the 1840s till the present, uh, till I became governor in 2019, all the debt has, that had been accumulated by the state of Florida, we've retired 36% of it 
uh, just since I've been governor, and we're doing even more this year's budget. We have a program uh, that's continuing that we started to accelerate repayment even more. So we now have the lowest per capita debt of all 50 states in the United States. I mean, that's pretty good. That's certainly not what they're doing in Washington. So it just shows you, you can be a good fiscal steward, you can pay down debt, you can cut taxes, you can even reduce overall spending while still making major, major investments in the things that Floridians really care about, which brings us uh, to why we're here today. Uh, we have over 23 million people now in the state of Florida. Uh, we have industries that really rely on us continuing to modernize and taking care of our infrastructure, whether it's agriculture, whether it's trucking, whether it's shipping. Uh, we need to do this, and Florida's rural communities are a big part of that uh, in terms of how the economy functions. We know that there's a lot of things that need to be done in some of the more urban areas, and we've done a lot for that. Uh, but I don't think any administration in, in modern Florida history has done more uh, to bolster rural communities throughout the state of Florida than we have. Uh, just over the past year alone, uh, I've awarded $90 million through Florida's Rural Infrastructure Fund to our rural communities. Since 2019, I've done over $257 million through the Job Growth Grant Fund, which is not only for rural, it's for everywhere, and we've done a very big mix. But we've made a huge impact on some of our rural communities by doing those job growth grant funds. And so we're proud of doing that. I also mentioned moving Florida forward. We recognize that just to keep our head above water, we needed to be doing more for infrastructure with the population growth. And hopefully, if we really made a big investment, we can get ahead of some of this and actually alleviate some of the traffic that we see in different parts of the state. And so we launched Moving Florida Forward in 2023. This effort, and thanks to the support from the legislature, has expedited 20 major interstate and roadway projects aimed at reducing congestion to address Florida's um, expanding population. Now, you uh, look at how the federal government spends money, they will appropriate tens of billions of dollars and build like three electric charging stations. I mean, they'll do things that are just crazy and how the money's being used. Uh, so we have secured billions of dollars in funding to accelerate these projects. Uh, one of the biggest one is the lane expansion and interchange reworking along the I-4 corridor. Uh, for those of you who have ever traveled from Tampa to Orlando, uh, on that, you know, you never know when you'll just be stopped. Uh, there's certain certain parts of the state where there's going to be rush hour traffic, and we want to work to alleviate that. Uh, that is a stretch where you could be at any hour of the day, and you could just end up stopped. Uh, so that's a major, major effort. Uh, these projects are all ahead of schedule. They have funding. Some of them weren't even expected to start until next decade. Some of them weren't going to be finished for another 10, 15 years, so we're able to, to beat this not just by months or even a couple years, but in some cases 5, 10, 15 years ahead of schedule. So that's really, really significant. Now, uh, we also understand that as good as all that is, the Rural Infrastructure Fund, as good as what our, we've done in our work program for Florida Department of Transportation, as good as what we've done for moving Florida forward, uh, we have other ways where we can help bolster and modernize Florida's infrastructure, particularly in our rural community. And so I'm uh, excited to be able to make the announcement today that we are going to be working with the where Florida Department of Transportation is going to be working uh, on distributing $122 million in funds to a lot of rural communities throughout the state of Florida, and I'm going to go through this in a minute. So we have a couple programs we're going to be using. One is the Small County Outreach Program. Uh, this assists small county governments and rural municipalities in repairing or rehabilitating county bridges, paving unpaved roads, resurfacing roads, addressing road-related drainage issues, and or increasing lanes on the roads. We also have the Small County Resurfacing Assistance Program, which assists small county governments in resurfacing and reconstructing county roads. And so we're going to be doing $122 million split between both of those two programs as follows. $4.25 million for Bradford County, $5.24 million for Calhoun County, $2.5 million for Citrus County, close to a million dollars for the rural part of Collier County, 
almost three million for Columbia County, 2.3 million for DeSoto County, 2.5 million for Flagler County, 1.9 million for Gadsden County, 2.2 million for Gilchrist County, 2.3 million for Gulf County, uh, 594,000 for Hamilton County, 1.1 million for Hardy County, 5.6, 4.6 million for Hendry County, 4.8 million for Highlands County, uh, almost 1.5 million for Holmes County, 1.5 million for Indian River County, 4.3 million for Jackson County, 1.8 million for Lafayette County, 2.5 million for Levy County, 7.7 .7 million for Liberty County, 1.45 million for Madison County, 1.55 million for Martin County, 2.2 million for Monroe County, 2.04 million for Palm Beach County, rural parts of that, 9.12 million for Putnam County, 2.2 million for Sumter County, 3.6 million for Suwannee County, 2.6 million for Taylor County, 3 million for Union County, and 6.4 million for Washington County. So that is going to make a difference uh, for these communities, uh, particularly the, the um, uh, municipalities and the county governments. Now they're going to be used in a different way. So here's a few examples. In Columbia County, the funds will support resurfacing Southwest Burley Road from County Road 242 to County Road 252. In Levy County, they will go towards widening and resurfacing County Road 346 from US 19 to US 129. In Madison County, funds will be used to reconstruct Old County Camp Road from Tompkins Avenue to Bird Avenue in Suwannee County. They will support the widening and resurfacing of County Road 250 from 193rd Road to State Road 51 in Putnam County. The funds will go towards resurfacing County Road 315 from the Marion County line to County Road 310. Um, now, these awards allow the Florida Department of Transportation to fund projects that support infrastructure for evacuation and emergency preparedness, enhance safety on state-owned rural highways, and to strengthen rural communities. And with today's announcement, I'm happy to note that since 2019, Florida Department of Transportation has provided more than $1.2 billion in direct assistance to rural counties with critical transportation projects. So that's a job well done, and that's been very meaningful. Um, I'd also uh, like to point out that uh, some of these funds are going to uh, areas that have been affected by recent hurricanes. I mean, we saw in 2023, we had Hurricane Idalia, and then this year, almost on the same track, not as powerful, but still left a lot of water, uh, we, had, we had Debbie, and so 38 million of today's 122 million uh, our support is going to support important projects in those Big Bend communities that were impacted by those two hurricanes in consecutive years. So uh, I think today is a big win for rural Florida. I think this is something that's going to make a big impact. I appreciate what Jared has done at the Department of Transportation to um, really make sure we're, we're trying to get ahead of as much as we can and trying to move all this stuff uh, ahead expeditiously. Uh, so this is going to make a difference. I'm excited to be here to be able to make this announcement. We're going to hear from some other folks we have, and we'll start with our secretary, Jared Perdue. Thank you, Governor DeSantis, for your continued leadership. Really proud to be here today with you to announce this $122 million investment in rural communities as part of your focus on Florida's future budget. Um, as a resident or someone who grew up in a rural county in Florida, I'm from the Panhandle, I'm very grateful for the governor's continued leadership and really he understands the importance of rural communities in the state of Florida. I'm proud to be serving as the secretary and have the opportunity to continue making those investments in our rural counties. And you heard as part of our small county outreach program and small county resurfacing assistance program in the budget, there's $122 million of investment. Since 2019, I just want to repeat this, we have invested nearly $1.2 billion as part of these two programs in our rural communities. And that is really thanks to the governor's leadership. So thank you, Governor, for that. Um, it's really due to the governor's leadership and the continued support of our legislature year in and year out, really understanding that transportation infrastructure is critical and has a direct impact on your quality of life and also has a direct impact on our economy and helps us grow in a way that maintains that 
quality of life for many years to come. It's been an honor to roll out the governor's Moving Florida Forward initiative, and you heard some of the, the projects we're doing, I-4 in Central Florida specifically. We don't know when that project would have been funded. That project alone is a $3.4 billion investment. If the governor had not led and invested the $4 billion of general revenue surplus, that project would have been years in the waiting. And so really grateful for his leadership and grateful that the legislature funded that initiative. We have a long-standing partnership with our rural communities at FDOT. We really, truly appreciate the relationship, the partnership. As you heard, many of our rural communities, these last two hurricanes, um, Hurricane Adalia, Hurricane Debbie, really suffered pretty bad impacts from both of those storms. Even though Debbie was not as strong of a storm as Adalia, it still had significant impacts, especially with rainfall in some of our rural cities and towns. And, and really, we were very happy as FDOT to step in. And with the governor's leadership, we're able to come in and help our rural communities with clearing roadways, with removing debris, helping the power restoration effort, and really help these communities get back to normal as quickly as possible. I'm really proud of our District 2 team here in the North Florida region who have helped many of our rural counties recover. And we've even had missions like clearing school bus routes so our kids can get back to school on time and safely. So really proud of what our team at FDOT has done here and really thanks to the governor's leadership in enabling us to help our rural communities in their greatest time of need. So with that, again, Governor, thank you. Uh, these investments are truly tremendous. I know they're going to be very impactful for these rural counties, and we're excited to roll those out. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Shane Morgan, Columbia County. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Governor Santos, for the invitation to be here today. I greatly appreciate it. So why is an emergency manager here today? What role do we have in transportation? Well, the Florida Department of Transportation, they are one of the many great partners that we have in emergency management during a time of crisis, but also during a time of non-crisis. We work very closely with DOT day in and day out, and they are a valued partner every day that uh, and help us do our jobs to the best of our ability. Thousands upon thousands use the roadways within Columbia County and also our surrounding areas on a daily basis. Having access to infrastructure is extremely important for many reasons. It could be residents driving the roads for errands, going to work or school, making memories with family and friends. They're used in a number of different ways, as we all know. That dependence, though, it escalates during times of emergency. Transportation infrastructure is key because we may need to evacuate residents out of harm's way. We may need to move personnel, equipment, other vital supplies into impacted areas, not to mention we may need to get responders into areas where search and rescue is a priority. Emergency management is made up of five mission areas. We have preparedness, prevention, response, recovery, and mitigation. It involves the planning and coordination to ensure that we are prepared to face unexpected events and minimize their impacts on our residents and visitors, and visitors to our area. Emergency management can include everything from early warning systems to disaster recovery plans. To be effective, emergency management requires the coordination between multiple agencies and communities. Without that solid transportation infrastructure, our ability to respond to these times of crisis will be severely hampered. Emergency management and transportation are not independent of each other. The two are deeply connected by investing in and maintaining that robust transportation system and preparing for emergencies with thorough planning and coordination. We then lay the groundwork for a more resilient, efficient, and secure future. This money will go a long way to helping us become more resilient, more efficient, and more secure. Thank you, Governor, for having me here today, and thank you all. Okay, uh, Desiree Mills, Levy County Commission. Good afternoon. As the governor said, my name is Desiree Mills, and I'm the chairman of the Levy County Board of County Commission. I'm excited to be here today and excited to be receiving an award for infrastructure for rural Levy County. On behalf of Levy County, I want to thank everyone that has helped make this award possible. I want to thank you to the governor and his staff for realizing the importance of rural infrastructure and for supporting our projects continuously. I want to thank our local legislators, Senator Keith Perry and Speaker Pro Tem Chuck Clemens, for always being there to help us with projects and help us apply anything that, that they can possibly do. 
Thank you to the FDOT for your assistance and for always stepping up to make safety improvements on our roads and our rural highways utmost importance. Florida ranks up in the top as a state in our nation for production of agriculture and row crops um, as far as commodities such as vegetables, watermelons, potatoes, and so on. Levy County is a vital part of that equation. As a farmer myself, I want to thank the governor for these scrap and scop projects that help widen our rural county roads, thereby making it possible for us farmers to get our products out of the field and into the grocery stores across the nation. I also want to thank him for widening the roads and enabling safe transportation for not only farm equipment, but for also our youth traveling in school buses, recreational vehicles, and even commercial fishing equipment coming up and down the road. Thank you once again for helping strengthen our rural communities. Okay, we got, um, so we got some checks to hand out. Um, I don't know if this is officially legal tender, but Columbia, if you guys want to come up and, uh, and take a photo. Well, enjoy that, and hopefully uh, there'll be more to come as we uh, do the budget for next year and continue to continue to do well as a state. And uh, this is important. It's important for the uh, resiliency of the community. It's important for economic opportunity, and then just it's just important for people to be able to get around. So, uh, so thanks for everyone who was involved in that, and we're happy to do it. Okay, we have any questions? Yep. It's not the anti-amendment for what it is is it's uh it's providing uh information about what florida law is and the resources that are that are available under that law they don't like that because they're lying about what's in florida law i mean i see in tallahassee they run commercials against corey simon say he that there's no exceptions that's not true uh they lay out what the law is and the resources are and the fact is uh, the Florida legislature has enacted legislation that said abortion is available until there's a fetal heartbeat with exceptions for rape, incest, life and health of the mother and victims of human trafficking. That's the law. They don't like that because they want to argue those things like they have in other states. So I can understand you know, why, they're, why they're pitching a fit because they want to lie. We have a responsibility to tell the truth about what the policies are in the state of Florida, and that is 100% accurate. Uh, it is not weighing in on a specific uh, amendment, and quite frankly, a statute is different than a constitutional amendment. Uh, you know, if there's any area of law you don't like, you can always elect people or, or urge your legislature to change. When you're talking about a constitutional amendment, uh, like Amendment 3, Amendment 4, that's forever. Uh, that is going to be there. Uh, you can't legislate around it. So you look at something like Amendment 4, it's, it's not what it seems. It's very vague. They don't define any of this. They have a very clear agenda about what they want that to be. Um, it says health care provider instead of physician. 
Now, that maybe you just glance at it. That's a huge, huge change. Um, that is going to mean you don't even have to have a medical license uh, to be able to be green lighting late term abortions all the way up to the moment of birth. That's insane. I don't think any other state has done that. Uh, that's in that amendment. That cannot be undone by legislation if that is to pass. So that's something that's separate from what Florida's laws are, which can be changed at any time. You can go and do that. So these amendments are really significant, uh, but what ACA is doing is simply telling the truth about the resources uh, that are available under Florida law and what Florida law says. They don't like that because they want to lie. And I would just say, you know, if they're lying to you, these left-wing groups are lying to you, about what their amendment means, about Florida law. Why would you trust them to vote for this left-wing amendment? Uh, you know, it doesn't make any sense. And so uh, we understand why they're upset, uh, because they wanted to be able to lie and get away with it. And I think actually some of these ads should be taken off the air, because they're totally contrary to what statute is. But I think voters are going to be able to, to figure this all out, um, and they'll know kind of you know, what the facts are and what the narrative is. Well, but I mean, here's the thing. How many people would say that dis uh, displacing the role of physician would not put health at risk? Of course it would. People make money off this industry. We're, we live in a region of the country where you have largely very strong pro-life legislation across the southeast. If this amendment were to be enacted, you would absolutely have people coming to Florida for this purpose. And if people could make money, non-physicians could make money to be involved, they will do that. And there's not, the legislators, legislature's hands are going to be tied. They're not going to be able to legislate around that. They will not be able to say only a physician because they chose to use that term health care provider. And that trumps anything that would be done by statute. And just think about it. A health care provider can be a whole host of things that you would not want to pee, and these are very vulnerable people that are in these situations. Now, I think we should have some compassion to recognize that, but you don't want to thrust them in a situation where they could be taken advantage of, and that's exactly what will happen with this. I don't think any other state in the country has displaced the role of physicians. Um, this amendment would do that, um, and that does present a danger. There's just, that, that's just factually true, and I think most people on either side of this issue would agree that that's not a road we want to go down. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Um, since the recent school shooting in Georgia, there have been multiple threats made in school districts in Florida, including three made here in Columbia County within the last three days. Some parents want stricter penalties for students who make these threats. Is this something you'd consider looking into? I would. Uh, I think that we've taken school safety very seriously. I think most people remember the Parkland shooting in 2018. That was the year before I became governor. So there was a Parkland commission. There were all these things that were recommended. We really brought that in and bolstered school security throughout the state of Florida. And basically just recognizing that you don't want to make these inviting targets. And it doesn't mean it ends up being like an armed camp with all this, but it just means you have school resource officers. We have the Guardian program, which I think is really important, which basically allows properly trained faculty to conceal carry. Uh, people object to say, oh, teachers shouldn't be forced to, to carry. Of course they shouldn't be. No one's forcing them. Just the fact that that program is available, even if no faculty use it, these people that do this, they want soft targets. They don't want to meet resistance. So they're going to go to places where they think. So what Florida's done has, has we put a lot of resources into it. We've taken all this very, very seriously. And I think we're going to continue to do that. We have done things like behavioral threat assessment, where you try to identify some of these people before something like this happens. For example, in Parkland, when that shooting happened, before there was any even news about it, the people in that community knew it was this guy. They just knew it because he had been behaving in a certain way for so long, and they kept passing the buck. No one wanted to hold them accountable. So yes, you take these threats seriously. Uh, this is not any, any, any time for funny business. When you start talking about that, uh, there needs to be a response. So, so we've been very firm on that. There's additional things that, that you need to be done legislatively. Uh, I'm certainly um, uh, would be would be welcome to that. This thing in Georgia, I mean, we believe that your Second Amendment rights are really important. 
for protection. People obviously in this in, in Florida use it. There's all kind of sporting activities. It's it's a family tradition. A lot of times, there's a whole host of things that go in uh, with uh, with firearms. But to have a kid that's 14 that's had that much trouble mentally, that has been in and out of uh, the FBI was even looking at him the year before, uh, and then to have that parent just give him that rifle when he was too young to have it, but certainly not of proper mind and behavior to have it, that parent is being prosecuted. And look, that's something that, that, that was a, a negligent, derelict act on, beha on behalf of that parent. And I think people that, the people that I know who are the most enthusiastic about firearms, they're the ones that take safety the most serious. Um, and, and going through the rules of how you handle ha handle weapons, who should have them and who not. Um, and it seems like that family had a lot of problems, and, and he sh clearly should not have been allowed to have access to that on his own. Governor, is there any suggestion that the government state investigation into the petition fraud, that that could put Amendment 4 standing on the ballot at risk? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know what the rules are about that. I think it was, this was, that we had reports about this one group that was getting the petitions, they had submitted petitions on behalf of dead voters. That has been substantiated. Uh, we now know that there are signatures that have been accepted by some of the supervisors that don't match the voter file. So they are investigating this, as they should. Our tolerance for voter fraud in the state of Florida is zero. That's the only thing you can do is to have zero tolerance. And we want everybody to participate, but we can't be in a situation where People are trying to short circuit the process uh, by submitting invalid petitions, by having, you know, we're doing a lot to clean the voter rolls. Uh, we have prosecuted people in Florida who were illegally in the country and somehow registered to vote in the past. You know, down in Broward County, there was a guy, he said, he said, they told me to register. They said, it doesn't matter. No, it matters. <laughs> and if you, uh, everyone needs to know in Florida, uh, our Constitution says only U.S. citizens can vote. That's the way it's got to be. So we want to make sure that, that, that all those laws are upheld. Uh, of course, since I became governor, we've taken this more seriously. We have, in the Department of State, an office devoted to policing election crimes. They have uncovered uh, prima facie evidence of invalid petitions and fraudulent petitions, and they're referring it over to law enforcement. So people will be held accountable. Uh, but I think that's, that's what we know for sure. I don't, I don't know the extent of it, to be honest. Uh, clearly, you need to get a certain number of petitions to qualify, um, and most people get more than that. Uh, what is the delta from that? And I don't know that we know the answer to that, but, but clearly they've been able to do this, and, and I think people just need to know, particularly going forward, that, that you will be held accountable if you're doing this. And some of these people, we have a law in Florida, you can't, get pay, you can't pay these people per petition, right? Because that creates all kinds of bad incentives. So you can pay people to do it, but it's going to be got to be hourly, and they were they were being paid per petition. There have been evidence that have come out for that. So I think this has been really seedy. What's happened in this whole industry with the petitions, not just limited to this amendment, and there was a lot of complaints. And I think they acted appropriately to investigate it, and the investigation continues. But I can tell you, if people are found to have committed fraud, they're going to be held accountable, and you could just you could just take that to the bank. Governor, do you think it is that for ACA to cover a website about Amendment Four, and why is it being pushed out? I, I don't know whose idea it was. I mean, I think the reality is, is there was a lot of people in, in Florida that didn't know what, what the law was, didn't know the resources that were available, and part of, you know, this agency's in, involved in, in that issue, having an education so people just know. They know where they can get the facts, and they can make their own judgments about uh, what they think about the programs available uh, or the different legal principles that are at stake, um, you know, as they have a right to do. Uh, but the facts do matter, and it does matter what is actually in Florida statutes and what your elected representatives have actually saw fit to enact. And I think that that's different from some of the, some of the phony narratives that get put out there. So, so it's useful to be able, we got to be rooted in facts, we got to be rooted in truth, especially when you have, I mean, any debate you have, you debate what the legislature is going to do, you debate what this is going to do, um, it's important. Uh, people that are objecting are objecting because it's an impediment to them lying about Florida law. They want to be able to lie. They want to be able to say no exceptions. That's not true, but they want to be able to say it. And so this is an impediment to them because people will actually maybe look and say, oh, this is what the law is? Okay, well, why are they telling me differently 
why wouldn't they just be honest about that? Uh, but that's kind of you know where they find themselves in. So uh, I think that that telling the truth matters. I think our agencies need to be need to be rooted in that, and I think that's exactly what it is. There, there's not a single thing that they're pointing out that is inaccurate. Uh, you can go right to the statutes, and you can look for that, and and that's just the the reality of it. So. Is it true about what Florida law says? It's 100% true. It's right out of Florida statutes. Well, uh, that's, I think that's you know, the interesting thing about this is this is so vague. They didn't define any of the terms. Uh, it's really an invitation. What it does is it takes power away from the people to be able to decide this through elections and who they elect to office and who legislates. And it effectively puts it in the courts where people are going to have, there'll be 25 years worth of lawsuits on what any of these terms mean. They did not see fit to define one single term uh, that's in there. They didn't define health care provider. They didn't define health. They didn't define viability. None of this stuff uh, was defined. So there's going to be people that are going to have interpretations that may, that may be different, but how do they know? It's not defined. They can't say what is what on this stuff without having definitions. And that's the point. I, you know, these amendments, they're supposed to be citizen initiatives. What they've turned into is special interest initiatives. So Amendment 3 is the, is the corporate marijuana amendment. That has been funded over $80 million by one big marijuana company, True Leaf. So ask yourself, why are they putting an 80, maybe end up $100 million? Are they just doing that because they want to be uh, good citizens and participate in the process? No, they're doing it because they're hot wiring the amendment so that they can profit from it. For example, the amendment says that uh, you have basically a, a big weed cartel of incumbent companies that are allowed to, to grow it and sell it. You're not allowed to grow it in your backyard. Uh, so they say you'll have a right to possess and smoke marijuana more than any other state allows, uh, but only if you buy it from them. And oh, by the way, they've given themselves total immunity from civil liability. Uh, that's never been done before, in my knowledge, in Florida's Constitution. Uh, so, so that's what they're doing with that because they're going to benefit from that. They're spending this money to benefit from that. And so the question is, do you think that's an appropriate use of a state constitution to basically create a, a, a weed cartel that's going to benefit a handful of incumbent companies? Uh, and that's even if you like weed, I don't think people think that's good, right? Um, I don't think they think it's not true legalization if, if you can't even grow it in your backyard. So there's all these issues. And that doesn't even talk about um, what goes on with public consumption of this. It's interesting. We have medical marijuana. I implemented it when I became governor. A lot of people use it. That's fine. A lot of it's been, I think it's benefited people. I hear people tell me it's benefited them. But in that marijuana amendment, it says you can regulate the public use of marijuana. You don't have to accommodate public use of marijuana because I think there was, they were sensitive to the fact that we don't want to turn into Denver or New York City where you have this just everywhere on the street. Well, this amendment that True Leaf is funding, and by the way, Amendment 3 was written by the CEO of True Leaf, the big marijuana company. Written by the CEO. It's a, they've admitted that. There's nothing in their proposed amendment that authorizes any restriction of public use. They say you can't be penalized for possessing or, 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 or using it. Um, I don't know how you'd regulate it in public. They did do it for medical. They have not done it for recreational. And you got to ask yourself, why would they make that choice? But make no mistake, this is being funded by one company because they stand to benefit from it. Same thing with Amendment 4. Why did they choose health care provider instead of physician? Because I think they're going to be able to profit from it. The people funding it will be able to profit from it uh, by doing that. And that's not the way... Uh, we want to do business. That, that is not an appropriate use of a constitutional mechanism. So uh, I think it's been, um, I, I think this is really basically who has money to try to, to, try to drive this stuff. And you know, people are going to start paying more attention to this over the next uh, couple months, I think. And it's interesting, a lot of people, th these things have kind of been under the radar. Um, I talk to people that are very knowledgeable, and they, they don't really know what, what's in this. So, so that's going to become more and more apparent uh, what's in it, and people are going to be able to make their, their judgments on it. But in terms of 
what Florida law is on any of these subjects. Uh, there's a right and wrong answer on that, and, and, and everyone needs to know the truth, and I think that that's totally appropriate, whether you're talking about, uh, whether you're talking about uh, culture of life, whether you're talking about medical marijuana, whether you're talking about, uh, and we've had the Department of Corrections point this out, you know, some people say, you know, I, I don't really, you know, marijuana's not for me, but I just, I don't think people should be rotting in prison for smoking marijuana. Well, guess what? How many people are currently in Florida State Prison for using or possessing small amounts of marijuana? I know the number, zero. Not one person is in prison. I don't think they should be either. If that's what you're arguing for Amendment 3, why would you create this weed cartel, give them immunity, all this other stuff? You can just say in law, hey, no one's in prison now for it. No one's itching to put anyone in prison for it. Um, and so you can even you could add that. You don't need to because that's just the practice. And so it's important that people know the truth. And the, the other marijuana offenses that are more low level, the people that are, uh, so it's beyond just smoking, but they were convicted of other offenses. So think about it. If you're driving while you're impaired with marijuana and you run into somebody and maybe you, you, you kill someone, you get convicted of manslaughter, vehicular homicide or something like that, and you were high and you had marijuana on you, well, then they may tack that on to prove that, that you were high when you did it. So there's, there's reasons for that. But in terms of just uh, someone using marijuana in their home, not, not bothering anyone, nobody is in prison for that. Uh, and I've pardoned people for marijuana offenses. So, so put that issue aside when you're dealing with that. That's just the fact. Department of Corrections can confirm for you the number of people. And I don't think we should be going into these debates under the impression that somehow, like, our prison is full of, of low-level marijuana offenders, because it's just not. Our state prison has people that have committed really serious offenses. And my view is you keep them off the street so that we're safer rather than putting them back on the street like they do in so many of these other states uh, around the country. So um, we'll have a lot uh, to say over some of these things over the, the coming weeks. Uh, but I do think that, um, you know, people just deserve to know the truth. Uh, we got to be very clear about that. Uh, and let the chips fall where they may. Thanks, everybody.